why don't you get us started, Jennifer? Tell us a little bit about what you do, just a really quick snapshot, and, and more okay. importantly, how you use communication in your organization. My name is Jennifer Katua, Director for the Tengeme Children Program, and uh, we support children in, uh, in education, that is primary, secondary, and universities, and we also have vocational training both junior and senior classes, and we have an economic empowerment uh, program also for our for the guardians or caregivers. Before we have used uh, storytelling, we have heard stories like following stories of, uh, of our children, how uh, taking them back to their homes and uh, they give and give a story about uh, where they have come. They are this, this thing that we are selling, my dream, like what is my dream, like just focusing on our kids, just uh, saying what their dreams are. But mm -hmm. what we have done, what we have tried to to discourage is uh, taking photos when they are in their pathetic situations, at mm -hmm. least because they are in our program, we don't advocate like like exposing abilities. I mm -hmm. remember one of the guys who came here in Machakos and he said he wanted to go, and one of our donors, and wanted to go to to the field, and we took him to the field. But mm -hmm. it was uh, when uh, when when he went to the family, he was like, and came back, he was like, you know what? When I look at these kids here in Ijitengeme, you cannot you cannot compare, uh, you, you cannot connect, you cannot. When you look at how they look when they are here in Ijitengeme, you can never connect to where they are coming from because when mm -hmm. they are here, they are all equal, they are shining, they are beautiful, they are photos they are sending, they are very good. But immediately you go to their home areas, you mm -hmm. see all the difference and that is the only time you can understand really these kids are coming from a, are coming from a vulnerable background so mm -hmm. we are used uh, photos we have used the stories in a, in the fundraisers all that but we try as much as we can not to, to not to use photos that depict vulnerability when we are doing all that because these are children who are in our program and then it means their lives must have changed because they are with us in the program thank you thank you jennifer that's Really good opening. Welcome, patients. Welcome, Marinola. We just got started. So I just give a very quick background to the project and basically saying that um, I'm trying to, I'm contributing to a chapter in a workbook that's been put together by a, a group of various experts, um, mostly from the global south, but we are being coordinated by some colleagues, um, you know, across the continent. And we are really just reflecting back on how stories, how our stories, how communication basically has been as nonprofits. Um, it's usually our stories as organizations and our communities that are depicted out there in photography and stories um, of various kinds for various reasons. And I thought that for this workbook to actually make sense and put something forward for practitioners to think about a little bit differently, it would not be complete unless I got your voices, your authentic voices um, on the table. So we are just going around, just doing a very quick introduction about the work that we do, and then just a quick overview on how we, you know, how we use communication basically in our organizations. Um, maybe I ask Chloe to go next. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Chloe Namase. Um, I'm putting off the video because of network. The weather is a little bit bad here. That's I work as the communication executive at Wesetia Impact. Um, briefly, what Wesetia Impact does is that our work revolves around equipping youth with skills and tools for entrepreneurship and work. And the main the goal is that young people are able to to start businesses and grow them and sustain their businesses um, for them to be economically and socially empowered. Why, what we have been, the other question is around communications and mainly we use communication for um, one, communicating our impact and the other is maybe building our, our brand, being known for you know, the work that we do in the space of entrepreneurship and us working with young people. And it's more of like evidence of work of, of our work as well as the impact to the different audiences that we work with or the different stakeholders, stakeholders that we work with. Um, and our communication is usually divided into us understanding the internal communications as an organization and also understanding um, external communications for the different audiences and what are we communicating? Mm -hmm. For example, if it's a donor, different donors have different areas of interest. Um, 
we we were whereas we work with young people we we work with young people in vocational schools and one, and young people in the community so sometimes you may find someone interested in the vocational schools so basically it's us communicating our impact and and building our brand and being on for what we are doing and the other thing which is obvious is of course for us to be able to raise the funds to to be able to continue the work that we are doing as an organization Jennifer shared something about what kind of, you know, things you're sharing out as you're communicating. And some of the things that we have um, avoided is, especially with the pictures, is we avoid sharing pictures that show that, you know, we are doing badly. <laughs> Even if someone hasn't yet started a business or they don't have that. The income to start a business you don't you really have to you keep the, the picture <laughs> i'm yeah. happy you have to you have to not show the bad side whereas we need the money to support the young people how you're communicating that also matters yeah let me pin that on a little bit i'll come back to it and maybe come to you monica my name is Monica and I work for Gallup Initiative Uganda and of course our niche and our work is ensuring that we position women and girls in the center of development of course through all our programming which is quite holistic and community driven. In terms of um, how we communicate, mm. how we use communication for the organization, I think my reasons here are just like what others have said. I think for us, we do communication to be able to share our own narrative mm. because oftentimes different people write stories about us mm. or let's say, for example, someone could write a story about Uganda, about Gallup. That is their narrative. Mm. So for us, when we communicate through our different channels, it gives us the opportunity to tell a story in our own lenses. Mm. You'll agree with me that certain times a funder could ask you to share a story and they will, they, will, they will position that story in a way that achieves what they want. So sometimes you don't have control of the angle the funder takes. Mm. So for us, when we communicate, we are communicating it from our own angle, from our own narrative that if you really want to know us in depth, it's very important for you to read through our own channels because that's the language that we speak, which is not biased. And uh, so for us, it's about telling our own narrative as it is, uh, other than tapping into the narratives of others, because certain times a story changes perspective. It's still the same story, but the angle changes. For example, you look at a scenario where someone tells you, can you share with me stories of girls? And yes, your partners, but when they share those stories, it looks like they are a reason for the impact. Mm. You understand? Mm. So they become the Jesus in the story, <laughs> which again goes back to them. But so for us, by us being able to communicate, then we are being, being very authentic in terms of our own truth, in terms of our own narratives. And oftentimes we make sure that we communicate in ways where the words of those that we represent are actually out there. Mm. So a lot of videos where girls will speak for themselves, community leaders will speak for themselves other than it being us speaking for them. So mm. that's how we communicate, but also we communicate definitely to showcase that uh, our work is very impactful on the ground and just to, to share with the world that yes, when you, when you do this kind of investment, this is what you're likely to get and this is it, given the examples. But we also communicate to be able to connect with the world. It's a very so we are really into a global space that sometimes I imagine surviving in this philanthropic space without having very good communication. I, I bet it's very hard. Like you can't compete with people who are really investing in communication. Yeah. So for me, I think it's the only way of connecting to the world that you go to spaces and people are like, I know you, I know your name, I know your organization, but you've never met. It's because yeah. as you continue building your brand and building your channels and putting information out there, of course, bearing in mind that it has to be consistent. You don't communicate about 
let me give an example that you're working with girls, then tomorrow you're working with, I mean, there's all that you have to take into consideration to make sure that mm. your communication is clear and on point and you're not actually confusing your audience out there. So even just choosing what do you post, what don't you post, what do you post at what times? I mean, those are some of the reasons why we communicate as an organization. Oh, thank you so much, Monica. So much to think about there. Patience. So my name is Patience. I'm from Malawi and I'm uh, very passionate about children with disabilities. And so I've been doing that work personally for the last decade or so, but as an organization for the past seven years. And so we've worked in the education and uh, health sectors and uh, communities, providing support to teachers, parents and community leaders so that we raise awareness around disability and then support the families of these children. Primarily our goal is to see children with disabilities thrive um, and live healthy, productive lives. And so we've been doing that through education, now um, switching to, to healthcare as well, but at the heart of it is really just supporting children with disabilities. So our communication has also evolved as we have grown as an organization primarily we use communication to raise awareness. So a lot of our communication is informative, um, raising awareness around the conditions that the children have, um, communicating to the, the families that we work with, communicating to potential partners um, to support for them to understand the kind of work that we do because we deal with a minority. It's very difficult sometimes to show success. And so we use a lot of communication raise awareness around the process that goes into supporting these children, for example, how long they take to progress in school, how long they'll take to progress through therapy. So our communication is very heavily awareness and information um, focused. And then recently we've now started using communication for advocacy. So um, it's kind of like just a step forward from awareness creation to now uh, being strategic about who we communicate to and ensuring that the communication we send out is used for policy change. Um, we're trying to influence the inclusive education policy currently in Malawi. And so we've been using a lot of um, communications and storytelling for that. Um, we heavily depend on photography and, and videography to, to share our stories. And we use hope-based messaging. So I think like most of you, we rarely, rarely depict children in pain because the kids that we are dealing with already look different. And so to add to the narrative, um, the layers of pain and poverty is just um, dehumanizing. And so we, yeah, it's our communications hope based, our photography is hope based. So we make sure that the photos we take have to depict um, the other aspects of the children um, that are happy, that are able, uh, as, as opposed to being disabled. And then um, in our, you know, kind of like story, story sharing, we have not really been good at communicating for fundraising. So kind of like what, what pig back on Monica was sharing about how this is a global space. And so it has been difficult for us because um, we, we're, we like being busy, being to, doing stuff as opposed to being busy seeming to be doing stuff and so a lot of our time is spent than showing um, but I think we're at the stage of the organization's life that we are now externalizing a lot of that communication to potential funders and um, potential partners that are outside of our usual space mm -hmm. so we're now doing communication for fundraising and partnership building and um, that is slightly different because the stories that you know they want to hear are uh, and most of the time, surprisingly, not success stories. You would think that they would, would like to hear more successes, but they they like to hear more problems so that they can insert themselves as the success. So um, we've kind of like managing that right now um, in terms of sharing that the communities are able, they just need the agency and we're there to do that. And then also for us, we're trying to remove ourselves from being the primary storyteller of these stories so basically doing more community-led advocacy and have the moms of these children tell the stories because even though I'm very passionate about this and kind of like dedicated my whole life to it I will never know what it means like to have a child with cerebral palsy because I don't 
And so having those parents share their own stories, their own struggles, their own successes, their own joys and pains is kind of like at the center of, of what we're doing right now. Thank you. Um, lots of food for thought there. So, you know, I'm hearing consistently this whole idea of showing the joys, showing the good side of things, not showing the bad side. And I just, you know, in, in that same vein, I just, I was curious, what does ethical storytelling and photography mean to you? Are, they, are there any like, you know, signs that will let us know that we are practicing ethical storytelling? So for me, ethical storytelling is about being intentional in terms of um, following a, a few safeguarding procedures uh, as we do storytelling so that as we engage with uh, their, our, I like to call them program participants, I don't call them beneficiaries anymore in my world. Mm -hmm. As we engage our program participants, they equally know that they are telling these stories to us and these stories and they do give us consent to share these stories with our external world. For me, that is ethical storytelling because you're following a few safeguarding measures to make sure that uh, these people, they are, they are protected. I shared with you my story and that's the version of my story. Then we have a guideline where you do not change my story without my permission. Even if you wanted to edit it to, to suit the English that you're looking for, it's important that you send it back and I approve that, yeah, this doesn't change the meaning. It's still the same, much as the English has been improved. So I think ethical storytelling comes more with safeguarding procedures that all of us should uphold, whether it's the organization or a program participant, or it's a funder, that even funders have to, to, to ask us for consent to use these these stories that shouldn't just be automatic just because they are giving us money, then it's okay for them to share their stories. Mm -hmm. I think it's only ethical when we they also send to us, for example, like a consent form that allows us to use photos, but then us being the intermediary between the program participant, we make sure that we have consent from these communities so that we don't have scenarios where people feel like you're making money out of their vulnerability Mm -hmm. So so I feel that ethical storytelling, again, is that. And I think Chilani raised a, a very important issue around if we are only showing the good side, mm -hmm. are we being ethical? Mm -hmm. I think it's a food for thought. Uh, if we are not being authentic with the mm -hmm. story, are we still being ethical? Mm -hmm. Or are there ways of showcasing vulnerability and by the vulnerability isn't bad but it depends how we bring it up into the conversation mm -hmm. is there a way we showcase vulnerability mm -hmm. and then showing that through this vulnerability this is how someone was able to move from point a to b much as i agree that mm -hmm. the images definitely have to be images of hope and uh resilience because exactly that's what those people are they are hope they are resilience to go through what they go through mm. so those are my thoughts thank you so much so much to think about that's something that I've also been trying to grapple with how do we still show the situation and I think patients mentioned it that she also wants to she spends time trying to create awareness and understanding of what those situations are and so that's a very good dilemma to think about like how do we still maintain that authenticity but still retain the dignities of the people that we serve Jennifer I thought you wanted to say something I saw you had unmuted Hi, Chilande. I thought uh, she has stuck on what I was about ah. to say about following up the procedures, getting the consent, and just ensuring that the stories remain authentic. I, I was just saying I was going to echo what my uh, what my friend there from Uganda said mm -hmm. on uh, ensuring that we get consent, and at the same time, we remain authentic. I wanted to... Um... Contribute. I agree 100%. I think the one of the best ways to do ethical storytelling, photography, videography, and however we collect the stories is by ensuring safeguarding, by getting consent. And, and I, I, most for most of the times, I think we usually don't say what we're collecting the stories for. Mm. We just said, oh, these will be used for it. There's, there's, there's that fine printer. Huh? Yeah. Oh, this 
to be used for uh, promotional materials, but you don't talk about what that promotion, you know, whatever is going to be. And, and I think that has, at least in our case, has brought where we actually break that down to say this particular messaging is we just want to let the other people know. Mm-hmm. And this one we're actually going to um, fundraise and this is what the money is going to be used for once it comes mm-hmm. um, so that I, what Monica was saying, we, they don't feel like we're using them. And then the other thing in terms of the balance between being authentic and, and telling the stories as they are versus maintaining the dignity, I think for us, what we do, I usually personalize a lot of a lot of it and, and go think about myself personally, how would I want a story of struggle, if it was me, how would I want my story to be told? Mm. And definitely I not want a story. Most of the times we don't tell stories that are currently affecting us. We usually tell victory stories, right? Mm. That mm. show there was a struggle and this is how we overcame. Very rarely will somebody actually open up about either a loss or about, you know, most of the time when you're going through that, there's too much pain to mm-hmm. even share that you you share it once you have overcome. And so when I think about the dignity there, it's always how do how would I want my story to be mm-hmm. to be told? And and then we're not saying that these um, families don't have problems. We're just saying that's not what defines them. Like the problem is not how they should be identified, which is what usually happens in our space. For example, for us, disability is, is an identifier, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you want to talk about them, you say, that child who has epilepsy, that mm-hmm. child who falls down, that child who is troublesome, they, they become identifiers. They become part of their identity, which is not true. Yes, they have epilepsy, but they're also bright. They're also creative. They are also, you know, they are also a sister. They are also, there's there's so many other things. And so for us, we, we tell stories from a, from a place of strength, from a place of, if we are going to tell a story about a struggle, we are going to be honest about that struggle. We're going to make that the main identifier of this person, such that they, that's their identity, you know, that their identity is, oh, that's, a, that's has two children with cerebral palsy no she's she's her she's a wife she's you know she's so many things and she also happens to have two children that have cerebral palsy and for us most of the with, with them like what monica was saying that because they tell their stories they share what they want to share and i think that's how we maintain the dignity if they're comfortable sharing that pain and that struggle at that moment mm-hmm. by all means they can share it but if if too raw for them then we're gonna wait until they're comfortable sharing that and so I think it's really actively working with the participants to say, what do you want to tell? What stories do you want to share? And then tell it from their perspective always and not ours. If we're going to tell from our perspective, then it has to be our perspective. So for example, for me, if I'm going to share my story, I'm going to start with, for example, what led me to do what I'm doing? What did I see? What did I feel? As opposed to actually making the story about the participants. So it's kind of like just a style of writing, I guess, and a style of storytelling that shifts the focus on the problem and the per- and then shifts it to the person as a whole, uh, as a whole vibrant you know, human being. Yeah, because it's something that I've been grappling with right now, especially in Kenya, we have famine uh, happening in Northeastern. And I've been getting all these photographs of people. It's 2022. I'm still getting these photographs of very emaciated, like bones, you know, the the kids are like seated, the usual, that photos that we used to see back then. And it just surprises me. And I'm like, I don't know how to feel about this. And and, and it's all, it's, it's a fundraising appeal, you know? And I just wonder if that's necessary, you know, is it, is it necessary? Is it because we have to show people and make it so emotive for them that they, you know, do we imagine that that's going to make me go into my pocket and give you money? Instead, for me, it just put me off. I was upset with the organization. And so I, sometimes I wonder, you know, what's enough and how do we even get that wisdom uh, to know how much of that story to put out there, uh, still get the reaction that we want, but still, you know, move forward and I you know I had Chloe you said something too and you were also very very categorical about really not showing that bad side of things Uh, do you have some thoughts on how you guys navigate this so Chilanda I would just like to contribute to what you just said um 
and, and I would like to look at it from the perspective of um, the program participant. If this program participant saw their photo in that bad state, um, would they be really happy? Would they go out to the community and and sh and you know be your ambassador as the organization? And definitely, if it was me, I wouldn't. If I saw my picture, I'm not happy. I am sad, and they're using it. I would definitely not want. You know, I would not go to the community and talk to think about you know that organization. The the other thing I wanted to also bring bring forward was. Um, it, it, the expectation uh, in terms of the stories that we share on the side of the um, of the funders, especially the funders, the, the expectations of the kind of stories that we are sharing. Um, at a certain point, when I had just um, I just joined with the Impact, um, the stories that were shared externally were being shared in, in, in terms of if the youth started a business, the costs were being shared in dollars. I, I kept on asking myself, and you know with these different price changes um, in, in, in Uganda and the prices of the, the shillings versus the dollar, I would ask myself, um, I really reporting the right you know, numbers that this young person started with for maybe a business. Because today, if you go online and check the dollar rate, it would be three, maybe 3,600. And then next week, when you go online, it would be about 3,700. And this is the story that you're sharing. And, and you've maybe you've shared the report today. And again, you, you want to go back and change and send it again because this you're already sent it out we look at serious so mm -hmm. some of us like in, when you're talking about ethical storytelling i like how um monica shared are you sharing it in your own narrative in your own way for me that's 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 the main point like share it your own ways if if this person said it with this amount of money to you know for their business share it that way don't don't make any changes uh, but also my experience as well in the field has been with the program participants so would be like oh you guys are taking our pictures or you know you're going to use to get money and, and if you're not giving us anything and it took me time that i had to sit down when i go to the field and i'm listening to this person sharing their story their journey of how you know they started their business how where um, how far it is i had to sit down and explain to them that you know your story is going to inspire another young person yeah. who is you know who thinks that the world has ended for them so like it took, I had to sit down and start explaining. So the first thing I do when I'm in the field, I introduce myself and explain to them, you know, what I'm taking your pictures for this reason. We want to inspire other young people out there. And, and it's okay to tell them that you also we also share them with people to get to get more funding so that you can be able to reach out to other young people in your same community that you are in. So it, for me, that part really count so much for you to, to be able to explain to the program, you know, program participant that, you know, we're taking your picture, you're sharing your story for this purpose, and this will be the impact of you sharing your, your story with the world out there. I really like that. So I'm just thinking, you know, one of the fun things that I like to also collect is, you know, what are some of those pet peeves we have in, in communication? Just great, you know, some, some bad practices. And you've already said something that's put for thought, Chloe, the idea of using dollars for, for depicting amounts of money when we know it fluctuates and we also don't use it in our countries. I know one of the things that I have been so adamant about with my colleagues that I work with that are in international spaces is, for example, the use of their weather patterns. You know, we shall do this in the summer. We shall do this in, in winter. And I'm always like, I don't know what that is. It's always summer here or some kind of spring, you know. <laughs> so do you have some of those examples? I'm just I'm just curious <laughs> about things you get upset about. Recently, we are having this debate around if we should include um, 
اوكي وزش اي دون نيو فينو ان كامل البيشنس كامل اللي تو بي كليت ام وزش اي امباكت باكس تو ابيب يان بيبل ويز ام skills and tools for entrepreneurship um, for them to be able to maybe start start um, and grow their businesses for economic and social empowerment. Um, so I'll be giving examples based on prices. Um, so recently, we, uh, internally, we're having a debate whether we should include prices um, or costs that these young people have encountered. Like how much, how much money did you start with your business? How much did you sell? How much do you have in your account, um, in your savings, something like that. And, and you know, some because we are working with different young people and in different areas and in different sectors, you may find that some sectors need a lot more money to start businesses. And then in some other sectors, you actually don't need any money. Um, you don't need any money to start a business. Uh, and so we were asking ourselves, what does this communicate? to 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 the people out there you know this person if this if we're saying if their prices are too low if their prices are below the the what is it called um if if a person doesn't earn above one dollar mm. uh doesn't earn above one dollar then we exclude you know prices and 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 you know when when what you think when you think about it um, following this discussion mm -hmm. is that you are intentionally it, you know, eliminating information because one young person is not earning above a dollar. Thinking about it now, <laughs> now I'm thinking twice. Uh, <laughs> are we really telling the story in the way it's supposed to be? Monica, what about you? I know you're always in a lot of those international spaces, especially. <laughs> Yes, and I was just taking down notes, just to also challenge our own thoughts mm. in terms of if you want to tell stories of uh, your national currency, mm. which is great, but sometimes a little bit of empathy is required. For example, again, depending where the story is going, mm. if it's going on your social media handles, absolutely, you could use your national currency. But I'm looking at a scenario where a particular funder, you're writing a report back to a particular funder. It's important to, to, to use language that both of you will understand. Because mm. sometimes what I've realized, most people in that space don't even know what happens out of their space. Mm. So that if I say that I used 5,000 shillings, or let's say this person began business with maybe 100,000, that's about $30. So that you, you, you still put it in the thousand, which is an equivalent of 30. So that you, in terms of ethical storytelling again, so that both of you understand what you're talking about. But again, I was still, I'll come back to those words, but I was still thinking about ethical storytelling and just say, how much of the praises do we take? Do we ever acknowledge other mm. partners in that journey? Mm. For example, if we are telling stories, for example, assuming you gave a young person 100,000 to start a business, do we claim to be that Jesus or do we acknowledge that this young person had other factors that really propelled, that really supported them to succeed? Do we ever do that? Mm. I do have a scenario dealing with an INGO mm. where the stories, they, they sent their documentation team came, they came in their stories about us. Mm. But when they shared it on their website, there was nothing like girl up in the picture. But they were talking about how they're having all these safe spaces without even acknowledging the pattern on the ground. Mm. That is not ethical. Because much as you're giving me the money, mm. it's important to acknowledge that there is pattern on the ground who manages this program and they're having these safe, safe spaces for girls. Mm. other than calling it your own because you're sub granting to me. I think that's very unethical. And going back to your story, Chilande, most people that really were caught off guard with showing miserable pictures mm. are international organizations. For mm. some reason, I don't know why, most of them. But I think the narrative is slowly changing that they are more cautious. 
-hmm. And I think inst instead of showing pictures of starved children, can we use statistics? Can we use graphs? Mm -hmm. Do we need to use photos for everything? It's one question. Do we need to show faces for everything? Or if you show the face, can you blur it depending on the kind of person you're dealing with? But again, do we really need to show the faces? Yeah. Can't we use other tools that communicate the, the grossity or the, the need to for action and maybe putting a note that we couldn't share pictures because we want to respect the privacy of this mm. community mm. other than just going full scale. Like Chloe said, if, if that person saw themselves in your social media handles or in a newspaper, how would they feel in terms of their dignity? How would they feel? Yeah, so in terms of the last question you talked about, some of those words, I think sometimes I struggle with the language that our narrative is quite different from the narrative that folks abroad use. So sometimes you take time to understand what does this actually mean? What do they mean when they say this? And you're just trying to navigate the language and saying, okay, here we say this. So sometimes the language is different. So it's very important to really understand what do they mean here and what do we mean on our end. And that's why I'm saying that sometimes for us to be very ethical and very authentic, it's important that we are able to tell those stories ourselves in our language, in the way we understand things ourselves. Patience, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, I think on the words, um, I would say just general NGO words, so frustrating, things like economic empowerment and, <laughs> and, and like, I mean, for us, we, we're doing, um, we're supporting, mothers of children with special needs primarily we don't um offer economic empowerment so we did a business training with them a business literacy financial literacy training mm -hmm. and we were reporting that as oh, we did a business financial train literacy training we hope that this will help them run businesses and they're like oh so you empowered them economically i'm like eh, not so sure not, not really we just did a business and financial training so I think some of the things in communication, like, like Monica said, is how they tell stories. And I realized this when I lived there for like a year, how they tell, we call it exaggeration. On yeah. this part of the continent, we call it exaggeration, but that's the normal way they talk. That, this, that's just how, like little, little things. So for example, you do a business training, it's called economic empowerment. You talk to girls, it's called motivation or, or self-esteem building. You, you talk to a parent about whatever it is that they're going through it's called psychosocial support you know like they, they use these terminologies that kind of like beef up and exaggerate what we do and my struggle actually has been over the years doing what I say we do mm. so if I'm gonna say that we offer learning support I want to be able to come and show you that a child has actually progressed because of the support when we talk about that, if you if you look at, if, for example, now if you look at our website, we now just decided, you know, we're going to say family support. We can then control the narrative of what we mean by family support. So I think that the way we define terms locally is very different from how they define terms. And the way, the way we tell our stories, we are not um, braggers. I'm yet to find, like Monica said, most of the people who are also doing bad, like uh, unethical storytelling, surprisingly, are people who hold accountable for ethics which is so bizarre because they are the ones who are always bulldozing us did you take consents did you do this did you do this but then they then change our stories without mm. our permission and what do they call it amplify that's the word they say we want to amplify your work <laughs> and, and do things that we didn't do right so again we signed a commitment some parliamentarians signed a commitment right they were going to present to parliament that they're going to increase funding for inclusive education. So I shared this with someone and how they then wrote about it was found foundations increases the inclusive education budget from 1% to 5%. I'm like, Lord, no. <laughs> we talk to parliamentarians, you know, or found foundations influencing parliament. No, we <laughs> met a subgroup of the parliamentarians had them commit to certain things, but obviously that's not going to, if that story is very long. So they would say, oh, we wanted to make it concise. <laughs> and that dilutes the whole point. So I think mm -hmm. part of the 
good thing of controlling our narratives is do we hold the people who eventually consume our our content do we hold them accountable for what they then do beyond like when we share do we hold the do we hold the people who engage with our content accountable for resharing for example or retelling those stories right I was in New York. I met the president of Malawi then and then I was telling somebody as well and then the way they described it patience brings the president to yes. New York for I was like the man was doing his own I happened to be in the same space with him. We did talk but I'm not the one who brought him to New York. But you in Malawi like leading the way, you know, holding the president accountable. I'm like is the president accountable. I'm sorry. That's funny. I mean, I, I had like a 10 minute conversation with the man. I don't know what I don't know. I don't even know if he's gonna remember me. So I think when we share our stories, the people that we share them to reshare those stories. And I think that's where a lot of the for me, a lot of the wording has has been diluted on the people who carry our mess, the people who are supposed to be our what do they call this? Our partners, huh? Because they want to also show, like Monica was saying, they also want to show success through our work. So sometimes our work, our success is not big enough for them to share. So they amplify it. And sometimes when amplify, it loses. What's your thought amplify? Yeah, it loses what it was originally supposed to be. So I, I guess that's also part of ethics, right? Like, is, is it ethical? to say you do more than you actually do you know and then there's this whole thing of let's see let's be seen to be doing things paint the vision bigger you know I, all these things that we have been told because even storytelling the way we tell, we tell stories in africa is so different from mm. the way Westerners tell stories and most of our communication goes to the west right yeah we tell stories a lot of our stories are stories of we you know we did this, you know, they did this. We always speak in plurals. In the West, they are very singular stories. It's I, it's mm. me, it's, you know. So like when we are connecting with them, is it ethical to, to write us, you know how targeted communication, is it ethical to change our stories to fit that market or to fit that audience? Because that's what we are taught, right? All these pitch decks, elevator pitches, fundraising, communications one on one, the story is always to appeal to them. So I get that there's different cultures, right? And how do we make them understand that the way we tell stories is not wrong? Because that's the assumption. Huh? The assumption is that we are not we are not shining a spotlight or, we are, or our storytelling needs work, it needs improvement, it needs What's the word? Refining. Is, is our storytelling wrong? Is it to say that, oh, we, we're just working with 50 chiefs instead of, oh, we're working with a traditional authority that's responsible for 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. ah, it's just 50 chiefs, right? Like, mm -hmm. so how do we kind of like tell our story? How do we stay true to us, to ourselves? Because it's really hard. To be honest with you, it's hard. Like, there's some messages that we, like some of those things I correct on the spot, but some of those things are awkward, right? Yeah. You just let the person, what else are you going to say? Oh no, he's lying. This is a person who is introducing you to a fund. And then you're like, no, actually he just blew that out of proportion. <laughs> so I, I think as a kind of like as a, for us as a practice would be, can we work together with those who are sharing the stories to kind of like cross share cultures kind of like raise awareness as part of our communication as opposed to kind of like just dishing the stories out mm. because that's my very long <laughs> two cents about the terminologies in the space no it's it's spot on it's 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 so much of why we are doing putting this document together and and it's always an interesting one because we put in so much effort to understand how they communicate uh, in order for us to respond to them. And I think what we're yeah. doing now with this initiative is to also, this needs to be a two-way street. Yeah, they should understand how we communicate too. Like we we are storytellers naturally. I don't, I don't think there's any African who can't tell a story. 
we grow up hearing stories. So for them to come and tell us how to do our stories is ba basically them being too lazy to learn our culture. I really found it shocking that they don't know. There'll be some Americans, right, who, who don't know anything about the continent. Mm. And these are Ivy Leaguers. And mm. you're like, what? Wait, what? what? What do you know then? We are here busting ourselves, understanding your politics, understanding the way people vote, understanding the way people give money, understanding the way people tell stories. What do you guys know about us? Yeah. You know, and if it's a partnership, they should know about our culture too. They should know it's, it's, it's disrespectful to, uh, to not, you know, acknowledge a chief in a community. They should know you can't call the chief by their first name, mm -hmm. right? But when we we have to tell them in first person, isn't it? <laughs> you call chief of a, of a whole 10 villages. Ah, Mr. Dryson. No, he's no. his chief, my love. He's he's chief. You have to call his chief as his name. You can't just use his first name and say, oh, you know, Banda, because that's their culture. You know, so things like those. I don't think that they're as sensitive to our culture as we are of theirs. That's, that's really something. The same way we spend a lot of time understanding them, their people, their ways, how they, their language, their culture, we are trying to put forward that in the same way they should also put in effort to understand how we communicate, you know, we being natural storytellers, you know, our phrasing and the same kind of thing in order for this communication to work both ways so that we're not only responding to one side, they should also respond to ours and somehow we'll meet somewhere in the middle. So I want to end because just because of time, not because of the conversation is complete, but I just, you know, uh, maybe as a parting shot, if anyone still has a point that they would like to make um, for us, uh, I've gotten quite a bit in terms of how some elements of good storytelling and, and, you know, good photography and all of that. But if there's anything you feel like you'd like to say as a last word before we close, please feel free. Just one last one experience that I I had this year. In the middle of the year, we had, uh, we had a couple of donor visits that happened. And you know, when, it, when you're having a donor visit, you go for your cream de la cream to be yes. visited. Yes. And that's what we did, you know, we picked, um, we picked up a couple of young, you know, young people that have interesting stories and whom we acknowledge that they have really transformed their journey in, in them being able to start a business and their business grown even despite that two years of COVID, uh -huh. they thrived. And, and then this donor welcomed them, they were excited, they visited the different you know, young people and we were all happy. Uh -huh. And it's actually after some months, actually I got to know about it this month, this actually in November, that this donor, the young, the, 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 she wasn't, like this donor wasn't happy uh -huh. with the young people they visited. And that information came through another, you know, another donor. It was more like a corridor talk somewhere. Mm. You, you get, and we didn't get that feedback. And I, I was really sad because, you know, the, the, the expectation that we have of, you know, of, of, of hit donors is on the high because, you know, there are the many people, we are up there, they are like, oh, Jesus, like how many God calls them. And <laughs> they didn't get to share this feedback directly. It was like, I tell you, you know, you heard of in Uganda, in Uganda, in Uganda, one of Mugambo. It was yes. like a Mugambo thing. How was that ethical then? Yeah. We took them to these young people. They listened to them sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. But also it comes back to what patients were saying. Their expectation. You know, for us, we are genuinely showing them these are our big stories. This is the big impact that we have had this year. Mm -hmm. And then they also have another expectation. Uh, but also looking at the different dynamics, the things that are happening, you would not expect, you know, someone to have a, a business of, you know, millions or, you know, a, a medium enterprise. We work with young people who are starting small. So also 
just a contribution and you know it was like for me was it ethical of them after all the time we put in the time they spent listening to these young people sharing why did that feedback directly to us or why did they sit down with us and ask us was yeah. it, what is the challenge this was the expectation of that story because we take in time and even ask, ask them what kind of business or what kind of you know, environment you want to visit while you are here. And we do, we take hours, we do prep, sometimes we send them schedules, you know, all that. And we didn't get that feedback. So for me, it wasn't really ethical of them. And I, I, I went through that this year, like there are like two donor visits that we had and, and it, the feedback came through corridor talks and I wasn't really happy about it. Yeah, Ilande, it goes back to what we said. I think it's time up. We began looking for monies in other areas as well, because it seems <laughs> like the funders we have talked to each other that, I mean, that was very unethical. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you're really supporting me and you're genuinely supporting me, it's okay to tell me where you think we need to improve and grow, yeah. other than telling another funder. I think Again, maybe it's not about storytelling, but I think funders really need feedback yeah. to understand that they need to value us and respect us for our yeah. being our authentic selves. Mm. Because yeah. if you, for example, that could even be a funder investing five k, and they expect to see, <laughs> they expect to see work of one hundred thousand k. I really feel that funders also should. You know, this is the conversation we keep talking in in in, in meetings and and just being bold. They yeah. should know where they stop. And I even struggle with funders who want to know people's personal lives. I struggle with that. I'm like, what do you want to know about me? What does this have to do with my work? What do you want to know? Because sometimes they tap into your personal, into your professional. Yeah. Second, sometimes you're just like, you know what, let me pull off my personal, off my, so you'll not even know, is Monica married? I don't know. Does she have a family? I don't know because that's not what I put out there. Yeah. So I feel that's very unprofessional. And these funders, I think have reached a point where they actually know each other. And I think even there are things you'll open up to a funder and they'll go and report you. So I don't know whether we should keep quiet and know where do, else do we report our own challenges, our struggles, because one funder will go and tell them, do you know this one is struggling with that? Mm. It's quite unethical that, mm. Funders should also appreciate that just like we make staff sign oath of secrecy yes. in terms of the institution, even them, if you came and did a site visit, it's important to give me feedback. And again, feedback is great, whether positive or negative, but not again taking it through another funder because you do not, not know how many other funders have that part of the story which is not accurate. And, and that brings up a very interesting point because when we share our stories, there's a lot, there's some detail that they ask for that, you know, it, it's a question of how much information really do you need to make a decision and how much of that information are you looking for that sometimes is just not necessary. You know, it's a fine line between what you need to make a decision and, and, and you know, and, and also tell the story without being intrusive. Yeah. And that's why, like you said, it's very important that we are allowed to shape our own narrative, put out there what we are comfortable putting out there. All right, guys, I really need. To, oh, my goodness. Uh, this is this is so sad to end. Um, but I just want to say you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will share with you the final whatever it is I put together. Uh, that you put out there. If I need to use any quotes from our conversation today, I will ask you before that happens, but I'll keep you posted. Thank you so much. And um, and I know some of you here did, did not have even too much notice, so I appreciate it. 